So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all well. And um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give today's talk. Um, as Shauna said, I recently had the opportunity to analyze the human remains that were excavated from um, the cemetery or part of the cemetery at St. Thomas the Martyr in Dublin. And the osteological findings have provided us with a greater understanding of the community who chose or were afforded the honor of being buried at this very important site. Um, and radiocarbon dating has highlighted uh, previously unknown pre-Norman activity, burial activity here, which also raises a significant question about um, future research on this area. So a lot of you will be very aware and um, knowledgeable about this area and the Abbey. Um, you may also have heard Paul Duffy discuss his excavation results from this site in 2018 at Medieval Dublin and the, uh, the, an article on this is included in the current issue of Medieval Dublin 18, which is being um, launched today. However, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the site, I'll just give you a very brief um, um, summary of the area. So the excavation site highlighted here in red was located at the site of numbers 30 and 32 to 36 Tom Street in Dublin 8 in the vicinity of the Abbey outside the medieval wall town. So Speed's depiction of Dublin shown here in the corner in the early 17th century shows the surviving elements of the precinct at this time. And as such, it was not expected it was expected that some um, of these remains would be identified in the pre-development excavation. So a lot of research has been published in this area recently um, over the last few years, and this has been informed by historical accounts and archaeological excavations. And the initial dedication for St. Thomas the Martyr appears to have been associated with a small chapel enclosed by a precinct around 1172. A priory was founded in 1177 um, on behalf of Henry II in atonement for the um, murder of Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, approximately 15 years later, this priory was elevated to abbey status. And um, in subsequent two centuries, a lot of remodeling and rebuilding works were carried out in the area. Um, the archeological excavations shown here in yellow with the license numbers and our red site um, have identified the probable extent of the precinct wall shown in dash black and the church shown in blue. Um, and artifactual evidence to, to date has included architectural stone, floor tiles and pottery. And these have shown links to the south of England, particularly Bristol, as noted earlier in the talk by um, Bruce Campbell, and France. And it's likely that masons and artisans were brought in from these areas for the various remodeling works in the church. So the Wellesley Abbey is considered to have had significant influence in the development of the liberties and the hinterland of Dublin. And the cemetery appears to have been a very popular resting spot from a very early date with individuals from the Anglo-Norman elite and a newly, the newly arrived affluent Bristol merchants likely seeking burial at this prestigious site. Notable residents include Hugh de Lacey via Longford and Beck, uh, Beck de Vabbey, his first wife, Rohise of Monmouth, and Strongbow's sister, Basilia de Clare, who appears to have served as a nun here. The canons regular of St. Thomas de Abbey were of the order of St. Augustine, and they took the vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience, and promoted care of the sick and providing hospitality to pilgrims. So in spite of this relationship, however, the religious and lay communities became fractious over time due to clashes in power and um, control of resources in the area. And the precinct was attacked by citizens of Dublin in the last decade of the 14th century, with the abbey gradually declining until the lands were ultimately surrendered to the crown at the time of dissolution. So the 2017 excavation revealed significant archaeological remains, including the cemetery, but also um, the outer precinct wall and the pre-existing boundary ditch um, and extensive medieval and post-medieval tanning activity. The extent of the cemetery shown here in purple is um, confined to the north by the east-west precinct wall and it would have previously been confined by the ditch. And the location of the cemetery was not wholly unexpected as 18 burials had been identified in a previous excavation in 1998 um, and these remains were subject to osteological analysis by Laureen Buckley, they covered the article there from Medieval Dublin too. Um, so she concluded in, that these individuals represented the healthy elite of society and that the likelihood was that the religious brethren were buried some elsewhere, possibly to the west. So this is a plan of the archaeological remains that were identified during the 2017 excavation. And it's obviously very densely packed and um, continuously reused land. Um, it, there's a clear distinction, however, between the medieval period in the medieval period, between the intensive success of tanning activity in cesspits to the north and the cemetery to the south, shown here in green. However, by the 17th century, the uh, tanning activity had extended into the disused cemetery, truncating and um, disturbing a lot of the burial remains. And as such, a lot of the skeletons were uh, presented for analysis 
in poor completeness and in poor or moderate um, preservation. Many of the skeletons were as well um, stained black due to tanning fluids um, and uh, effluent from the cess pits nearby. So 142 graves have been identified to date, including the 1998 excavation, of which 124 were excavated in 2017. And these graves um, generally res respected each other. They were all east or west-east aligned as expected of the period. And they were, as you can see in the plan, they were roughly um, in ordered in rows. Uh, there was very little intercutting except uh, in one area in the west and as you did uh, towards the south of the site. Um, so during the life cycle of the cemetery, it is clear that there was um, upstanding remains if it wasn't um, a cross or a memorial stone or a mound or something um, marking out these graves uh, to, uh, so they could be avoided by later activity. And uh, no evidence for shrouds or coffins was inferred from the grave form or the body position. And the burials were largely recorded in a single stratigraphic layer. Again, as you progress to the south, things got a bit more dense and a bit more activity was recorded. Um, as shown in these photographs, uh, disturbed and disarticulated bone was frequently found overlying or alongside later burials. Um, so these may, this bone may have come from outside our excavation area as a lot of our graves were uh, intact. Um, in one instance, a large charnel pit shown here in the top corner and um, the top left hand corner was recorded in the west site and this contained approximately eight intact skulls and a lot of long bones um, which represented a uh, minimum eight individuals. Also in this area, circled in red on the plan, were three adults who appear to have been covered by a lime deposit, and the excavator has suggested that these may represent um, plague burials. So osteological analysis carried out for all of the human remains um, retrieved during the excavation, and the primary focus here was to gain demographic data for the population that were buried here. Um, it's acknowledged, however, that these remains only uh, comprise a very small percentage of the overall cemetery. So what we're just getting a, a picture into the, uh, the population rather than a full view. So the cemetery population identified here represents a cross section of the community with individuals of all ages and both sexes represented. A third of this group failed to reach adulthood by the time of their death. Um, and this represents a normal profile for a medieval population given shorter life expectancies and increasing prevalence of disease and growing urban environments. and whatever power struggles or skirmishes that may have happened outside the medieval town at this time. So the burials were plotted by age and sex in an attempt to identify any zoning or patterns within the cemetery. Um, and as you can see on the top image, children and adolescents were spread across the site fairly regularly. So this rules out any distinction of age in this area. Um, the low incidence of intercutting indicates that above ground markers had been present, as I said, and it's interesting to note that in three examples, joint burial were recorded, uh, each in, in each case, including one juvenile. So we have an adult male buried with a young child, two young children buried together, and an adolescent also appears to have been buried with an older child. And graves containing multiple occupants um, have been identified in early medieval and medieval cemeteries. And there can be many reasons for this, which could be coincident death events or just practical efficiency, familial links, um, periods of high stress, associated with epidemics, something like that. Um, similar joint burial of juveniles has been identified in the medieval cemetery at Tintern Abbey in County Wexford. So for the adult population, we can see a slightly higher ratio of males to females were identified. And this may or this may reflect the dominated uh, male dominated religious community, or indeed the prestigious merchant class who were choosing to be buried here. The distribution of male and female individuals does, however, appear to be evenly spread across the burial area. And cemeteries attached to such an important abbey, we know, would have had specific areas for burial of the religious, um, the religious member or the religious community. So the spread that we can identify to date, we have not identified any particular area which was exclusive to uh, members of the religious order. Um, it just wasn't possible with this small sample size. Uh, we, there is, however, a cluster in the centre, which is slightly off um, orientation, which may have potential to represent with 11 adults, uh, adult males and three adolescents. However, um, it's just likely there was a more desirous location for these people, probably closer to the church down to the southwest of this site, or southeast of this site, sorry. So the remains were also assessed for evidence of health status, 
And some diseases, trauma, um, and occupational stress are evident on the skeletal remains. However, they're relatively few in the gamut of things that can happen to somebody. And a rise in disease prevalence is linked with urban expansion and population influx. However, the notable fast killers of this time, such as the Black Death, are invisible to standard osteological methods. So we won't be seeing, we, could, we can't pick that up through this method. Similarly, death due to soft tissue injury um, would equally not be discernible by these methods. So a relatively low prevalence of disease and trauma were identified for the um, individuals analyzed at St. Thomas Abbey when compared to the nearby medieval population at Stephen Street or Angel Street associated with St. Peter's Church. Radiocarbon dating has shown that this part of the cemetery at, at St. Thomas's had gone out of use likely by the peak of morbidity and mortality associated with the large epidemics of the 14th and 15th centuries, however. Um, at least 40% of adults were affected by a period of resolved or chronic um, illness at some point in their life at Thomas Street. While no specific infection such as tuberculosis could be confirmed, a multitude of causes are likely contributing to this infection pattern that we see in Thomas Street. Interestingly, the, uh, the osteological paradox means that um, those individuals with evidence for infection and surviving or infection are actually the healthier cohort as somebody who was um, more um, reduced immune system would die in a shorter period, uh, succumbing to death shortly and we wouldn't see it in the bones. So we are actually seeing the healthier portion of, of the group. So approximately 16% of the population with observable cranial remains were also are also identified as having um, metabolic disorders. And all but one of these individuals uh, died in childhood at the peak of growth and development. So what we're seeing are that the young children on site have been subject to either inherited or, um, or, or experienced physiological stress. And um, this may be due to conditions in environmental or cultural or social at the time of their upbringing. Um, evidence for degenerative joint disease um, is frequently identified in osteological samples um, and any population will have some level of it. And um, what we can see here is that it's lower and slightly less uh, severe than other medieval populations, especially, as I noted earlier, the, one, the large cemetery with, associated with St. Peter's uh, nearby. And approximately one fifth of the adults had evidence of um, degeneration of their extra spinal joints, so the knees, hips, wrists, uh, shoulders. And this is much lower than that identified for the monastic population at Tintern Abbey in County Wexford. So it does suggest that um, the adults in living in the vicinity of Thomas Abbey and burying there were doing or so just less strenuous activities and occupations and, and daily life. So in general, males at Thomas Abbey were slightly higher, uh, slightly more prone to degenerative changes than females um, when you compare age with age. And the disease prevalence increased with age, which is what you see in a lot of cases. Not only were a higher number of men affected, but the range and location of affected joints was greater for men as well. So the only individuals to be affected at three or more joints um, at Thomas Abbey were all men in their later 30s or 40s. And this pattern shows that the men were subject to a wider range of mechanical and environmental stresses in their daily occupations when compared with the women in this community. So although the incidence of trauma is relatively low in this population with only a handful of um, cases recorded for the cemetery, um, it is possible to make a tentative inference about a slight gender divide and the causation for the traumatic injuries that it was able to identify. So you can see here, um, there's a few different case, cases there and including possible our broken fingers, multiple broken ribs, these are all healed um, there's a blunt force trauma in our case there with the cranial. And what we can see here in the, the middle and the bottom is um, somebody who would have broken their wrist, potentially an outstretched hand, all healed injuries. But what the interesting thing is that there's a divide potentially between females and males and that the females may have been where trauma was identified with females. It seems to be indicative of accidental trauma, whereas where it was evident in males, it seems to be indicative of um, deliberate trauma, so or interpersonal violence, um, and it's just and it, it, the statistics aren't in there, but it's interesting to note for the few people that we do have. So only one case of perimortem injury was recorded, which is this skull shown in the top right hand corner here, and it was an unhealed um, blunt force trauma to the back of the head for a man in his late thirties or forties. So this would have obviously end, ended his life, um, which is 
interesting in its own right. So another, um, on a population level, we can look at stature as an indicator of general health and wellness. And this is estimated by measuring long bones, complete long bones for adult individuals and applying the results to an equation to get a standard deviation. At Thomas Savvy, the data was available for 39 men and 19 women, um, which came from the 2017 and the 1998 excavations. Um, and from this, we can see that the average height for males was 171.9 centimetres or five foot six. Um, for females, it was 158.2 metres or five foot two. Um, centimeters rather than meters, uh, five foot two. And as you can see by this table showing comparative medieval populations, this is favorable. They're the same as their, compar or their comparatives in other towns and cities or areas in Ireland. So where observable dental disease, um, we can look at the teeth and teeth can tell us a lot about our life, what we eat and our general health. And where observable dental disease such as periodontitis, tooth decay, infection, and plaque were recorded, um, it can tell a lot about the population in general and the individuals. Um, on a personal level, analysis of teeth can provide an indicator of health during formative years and later years. However, by comparing population data, it may be possible to make distinctions on a larger scale regarding diet, illness, and cultural practice. So the table here shows data from six medieval cemeteries and um, our St. Thomas Abbey is shown in black. And the Thomas Abbey data suggests that this community had relatively good dental health. As expected, dental disease increased with age and the majority of affected individuals were aged in their 30s or 40s at the time of death. The dental remains displayed lower or equivalent prevalence of caries or cavities in the current speak, periodontal disease um, and result resultant anti-mortem tooth loss and abscesses when compared with other medieval populations. A fifth of all individuals were affected by hy hypoplastic defects. These are furrows or pits that occur in the teeth or they're breaks in the natural formation of um, enamel due to periods of stress experienced in the formation of the teeth in early childhood. So a much larger portion of the community at Thomas Street than those buried in the nearby St. Peter's Church on Stephen Street, or indeed Tintern Abbey in Wexford, were affected by hypoplastic defects. And this can be um, indicative that the children living in this area had been subject to slightly, or in the latter areas, had been subject to slightly better conditions during early childhood. So those being buried in Thomas Abbey um, were subject to more stresses than their later um, equivalents in um, later Dublin. The majority of the population suffered from periodontal disease, marked by recession of the gums and exposure of the dentine, leading to infection, abscesses, and ultimately loss of teeth uh, during life. While these levels are high, they are roughly on par with other known medieval populations. So the most commonly recorded dental condition here is calculus, uh, known as plaque or tartar, and this was identity, identified in virtually all children or all adults and half of the children. And this likely indicates that the general diet was soft, sticky, non-abrasive foods. Um, documentary records suggest that the order of the canons at Thomas Abbey would have been subsisted on a simple diet dominated by fish. And this was supplemented by the produce of the land worked by the servants and the lay brothers alike. Isotope studies um, of medieval monastic diet in York indicated that the brethren consist, uh, consumed a varied diet with more access to marine produce than the lay folk. And this was associated with a lower rate of dental caries or cavities. Interestingly, the rate of caries identified for the community at Tintern Abbey is almost twice that noted for the people uh, laid to rest at Thomas Abbey, which seems to reflect an opposite scenario to that in York. So on this note, we can see that um, the isotope data for um, Thomas Abbey, I'm not an expert in this area, I should say, um, but by looking at the stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes, um, we can, it's useful in the determination of food sources that were consumed in the past, as it's reflected in the chemical makeup of um, teeth and bone for our human skeletons. Um, and as bone remodels at a quicker rate than, um, at a quicker rate throughout your life, it shows a different period of your life and um, diet and your health than teeth as teeth finish forming in your childhood. Uh, so uh, several of these samples with an asterisk and a T are showing uh, data from teeth, which reflects their early childhood, whereas the majority are bone, which is the period, probably the decade before they died. Um, and as we can see, just a very simple, simplistic look at this data. This is the isotope data that was produced as a byproduct of the radiocarbon dating process. 
So we had 14 individuals dated from Thomas Street, and this is the carbon and nitrogen information that came back from Queen's University Belfast. Um, and the 14 individuals, the adults here circled in the blue are largely um, clustered in a similar diet um, pattern. Um, whereas the two juveniles to the, uh, yeah, are relative outliers for different reasons. So for the adults, dietary intake appears to be balanced, although it's notable given the proximity to the coast in, in Dublin, that the data suggests the consumption of um, marine um, resources very limited. However, this does not rule out freshwater fish being consumed. Um, and the findings suggest that a similar distinction, perhaps between the religious and the lay folk may have existed at Thomas Abbey, although it would be um, interesting to have a distinct uh, religious burial area to be able to test this theory, whether we're seeing that difference in um, consumption between the lay folk and the religious community. I hope I'm being clear there, sorry. Um, so for the children, sorry, no, go back one, sorry. So the adults and the children appear to have different diets, but what we can say for the two children that have been dated here um, is that the osteological findings suggest active periods of physiological stress by time of death, and the isotope data seems to be confirming this in different ways. So in the bottom corner, um, the older child who died is circa eight years old, um, they this data appears to suggest they subsisted on a very low calorie or low value diet in the years prior to death. Um, and malnutrition is a lack of adequate nutrition that can be caused by not having enough to eat and not having enough of the right things to eat, but also being unable to utilize the nutrition due to uh, illness. Um, and the osteological evidence from the cranial remains suggests that this person, this child, did suffer a prolonged period of malnutrition. So it's interesting that the isotope data is confirming that. Um, and this is obviously after contributing to their early demise. A uh, young child, um, skeleton one up in the top, was died at approximately three years of age. And this is interesting in a different way, um, particularly because this was um, this child was buried in one of only two stone line graves at Thomas Abbey in the current excavation area. Um, and they were chosen for that reason for dating and for isotope studies. So this child approximately three years of age and the skeleton didn't appear to reflect any evidence for stress um, uh, using standard method, osteological methods. However, the isotope data interestingly indicates that this child um, was still benefiting from uh, breastfeeding or in the process of weaning at their time of death, which is why they're so high up in this um, chart. So previous studies in medieval populations has identified that weaning generally occurred in the second or third year of life. And approximately 60% of the juveniles in this cemetery has died before the age of six. So it's interesting to think that perhaps the peak in mortality that we're seeing at Thomas Abbey may be indicative of this post weaning period where children would have been susceptible to um, life threatening health issues at that time when they were being introduced to new foods and opening up new avenues of infection. So as the title of the talk suggests, there were a number of unusual or interesting burials recorded um, during the 2017 excavation. Two graves recorded in the Western Limited site deviated from the norm, norm is that they had been lined with stones. And I've already talked about skeleton one here on the right hand side. The increased attention and effort afforded to their burial given their young, very young age um, is interesting. And it's tempting to suggest that this child came from a high status family. On the left of the screen, the second stone line grave burial contains an adult male who died in his late twenties. And although much of the grave had been truncated and disturbed by later activity, enough survived to identify that this man had suffered from a chronic infection, possibly associated with mus muscle trauma of the lower limbs. And despite his young age, his relatively young age, this man is clearly an important figure in the community, having been given such a distinct grave. His resting spot also appears to have become a focus for later internments, and this desire by others to be buried in vicinity to him also is indicative of his status. So again, interestingly, two middle-aged men um, in the 30s, dating to the 12th to early 13th century, were found buried with perforated scallop shells at Thomas Abbey. And this, this shell, as many of you will know, is synonymous with the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, for which a starting point is the nearby St. James's Church in the next parish. The perforations indicate that the souvenirs may have been hung around the neck or body and stitched to clothing in a prominent location at their time of burial. Similar souvenirs have been identified at 
for individuals excavated in other medieval cemeteries across the country in Donegal, Galway, Westmead, Kerry. Um, sorry, that was a badge, but similar souvenirs anyway, at least. And for the most part, these people have been identified osteologically as male. However, one female was identified in Ballyhanna, County Donegal. So the religious community at Thomas Abbey, we know, is likely to provide it hospitality to returning pilgrims. And as such, it's not surprising that some of these individuals may have been afforded burial here. The opportunities to undertake pilgrimage would have been limited to those members of society who had access to time, money and the worldview to, to undertake such an endeavour. And it's impossible, or it is possible that these men identified here belong to the mercantile class. One of the graves, Skeleton 98, had been heavily truncated with resultant loss of bone and restricted um, this the osteological assessment. However, it was possible to say that this individual had very poor dental health with very heavy attrition noted on the teeth wear pattern, indicative of a highly abrasive diet. And this did differ from the general population um, at Thomas Abbey, suggesting a different diet. And the second grave was more complete, shown here in the center of the site, skeleton 108. And all that um, missing facial features and the dentition, we could tell that this man had suffered from a prolonged period of physiological stress, evident as chronic infection in the lower limbs and osteoarthritis of the spine, which was more severe in the neck region. Both of these conditions would have caused daily um, pain and stiffness for this man. There are multiple causes of osteoarthritis, including advanced age, pay, uh, occupational wear and tear, infection and trauma. So it's uncertain about the cause for here, but what we can say is that the inflammation of the lower legs combined with this is also likely due to excessive microtrauma associated with relative increase in frequency or intensity of exercise over a prolonged period. So undertaking a pilgrimage would have certainly put the body under greater strain um, during months of travel on foot and restricted diet. And the long lasting impact of such a journey is likely reflected in this latter individual. The two adults, a male and a possible female, both in their thirties at time of death, were found to have, or appear to have had stones wedged into their open mouths at the time of burial. The medieval psyche was concerned with ghosts and the undead, with the tradition of revenants playing tricks on the living known in Irish folklore. So the phenomenon of placing a stone in the mouth is thought by some to ward off evil spirits in the afterlife or to ensure that the person did not come back to haunt the living. At a minimum, a stone placed in the mouth at the burial is a deliberate attempt to highlight um, these individuals uh, whose behaviour may have marked them out as odd or threatening within the community, such as a sudden unexplained death. Numerous examples have been recorded in early medieval and medieval cemeteries across the country, and it's interesting to note that uh, this custom did continue into the 12th and 13th centuries, as evidenced here. Osteological analysis has identified that the woman um, suffered from a chronic illness and was active at this, which uh, the chronic illness was active at her time of death. Um, and she had per very poor dental health, including loss of multiple teeth, um, multiple cavities and a large abscess. So she would have been uh, distinctly in pain uh, uh, prior to her death. And perhaps her long term illness set her apart in some way from the community. So as I mentioned earlier on, radiocarbon dating was carried out for 14 individuals spread across the cemetery, and it was the, um, these individuals were selected uh, to try and get a hold on the, the development of the cemetery, but also to investigate particularly interesting individuals as just discussed. And we can see here on the calibration chart, the dated burial activity spans a period of approximately 300 years, commencing in the 11th century, well before the foundation of the Abbey. This highlights a previously unknown important church and burial area was located outside the city walls at this time. And the earliest dated individual is the man in the stone line grave, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and he seems to have become a focus for later internments. And the date range for at least four other people up in the top of this calibration chart appear to straddle that late 11th or early 12th century period, um, pre Abbey. So following the Royal Foundation, this portion of the cemetery was predominantly used within the first hundred years and uh, before potentially being abandoned for a more desirous location nearer to the church, the south. And these are just the individuals that I've previously mentioned. So the pilgrims are firmly in the first hundred years of the, of the um, found Royal Foundation and our stone line graves, um, one of which is the earlier burial and the child interestingly is also the first hundred years of the foundation. So in summary and in conclusion, 
The osteological analysis of the human skeletal remains from the medieval cemetery at St. Thomas Abbey have confirmed many of the earlier findings um, highlighted by Lorraine Buckley while presenting a more complete reflection of the community. The northern portion of the cemetery was populated during the first hundred years of the Royal Foundation with a shift in focus for burial, um, probably associated with the 13th century rebuilding phase of the church. While the cemetery was a highly desirous location for the upper echelons of society at this time, the demographic profile identified here suggests that there was no obvious restrictions for the wider community and a slightly higher ratio of males to females uh, was noted, which may reflect the male dominated religious community or equally the high status nature of its occupants. Um, it was not possible to confidently identify any exclusive burial area for the canons within the current excavation boundary, although it's likely to have existed to the southeast closer to the church. The community was relatively healthy, with low prevalence of disease and trauma compared with later medieval populations in Dublin. The adults appeared to subsist on a very varied diet, and all but with a limited marine intake, and perhaps this is a further evidence that we're looking at the lay community. Um, interestingly, two of the men buried at St. Thomas Abbey in the 12th to 13th century were accompanied by souvenirs of pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, confirming that these events comprised essential part of life for medieval Dublin um, citizens. Significantly, the radiocarbon dating has indicated that a burial ground was established here before the Priory Foundation, and it's an important avenue for future research to investigate the affiliation of this church and the genetic ancestry of its community. Thanks.